Zdaj pa sliš. start with the last uh, final panel for today uh, and it's three speakers uh, first one is Mirt Bezlai uh, of torture and despair uh, then uh, Kamil Bera and uh, Primoš Kraševec so uh, the floor is yours Mirt actually uh, represents more the process of writing this paper than uh, the theme of it because it was written tonight and um, at seven o'clock in the morning so it's full of mistakes and at some point I forgot how to uh, write in English I think so um, I'm sorry for all the mistakes um, well the most common question uh, every uh, metalhead is frequently asked is uh, how can we listen to this terrible noise that is uh, black metal and although this question may seem a bit naive at first uh, it's actually I think a pertinent one I mean indeed why why do we listen to this um, and the most obvious and simple uh, way to answer this um, would be to try to think about the extreme music genres as a uh, part of modernist art uh, which supposedly does not offer an immediate pleasure to its consumer um, but rather some kind of like pleasure after reflection to those uh, cultivated enough to be able to reflect on the contradictions and or dissonances uh, in this artwork. Um, and in my opinion, it is necessary really to understand the majority of extreme music uh, genres as a form of modernism. Um, and although uh, perhaps a bit late one, but still a modernism nonetheless. Um, however, of course, um, there are huge and essential differences between uh, genres and uh, even uh, songs. And Despite that, I will try to make just like a very general and schematic outline. Um, so in this relationship between extreme music and modernism, uh, of course we have uh, to mention uh, the noise, um, which is the only musical, well, if it's musical at all, genre, um, which actually has ties to historical uh, avant-garde. Um, it originates in Italian futurism. Um, Lu Luigi Russola uh, made the first noise concerts as soon as 1913, I think, and uh, wrote uh, the manifesto, The Art of Noises. And um, his music, or better noise, um, is actually an extreme form of mimesis, a veristic mimicking of city or factory noises which violently invade uh, the hearing and make the harmonic totality of the composition impossible. Uh, conceptually very similar experiments were done few years later uh, by Soviet avant-gardists, uh, uh, especially notable uh, by Arseny Avramov and uh, his symphony of the factory sirens. And um, all those early noise experimentations were, uh, as said, a part of the futurist movement, which tried to capture the invasiveness of the noises, especially those of machines, traffic, or industry, uh, into the subject, uh, not only by reproducing them sonically, uh, this even used to be a very common theme in futurist paintings. Um, but at the same time, uh, noises uh, in that particular music uh, often functioned similarly to ready-mades, um, as noises found on every corner could simply be copied and presented as art. Um, 
much later, however, noise, or at least some artists, moved away from mimetically reproducing the street noises and started to make own aggressive sounds that effectively destroy any structure or coherence. Here we could draw an, an analogy with abstract expressionism, perhaps, and similar trends in painting, uh, which were trying to free the colors from the clutches of form. Uh, noise compositions uh, actually often function um, with the same logic as, for example, drawing paints on the canvas. Um, and noise tries to destroy any coher coherence, often even that of a rhythm. If thus the goal of noise is the destruction of a form, it must be admitted that metal, and I mean mainly black and death metal and uh, grindcore, is in this respect without a doubt much more conservative. But perhaps uh, precisely because of this, it is more interesting. Uh, the destruction of the form is actually quite simple, and after it happens a couple of times, it ceases to be fascinating. Uh, what metal wants instead is to find a form of destruction. The experience of listening to music is an experience of uh, beauty, harmony, and totality, let's say, um, while noise, as we have shown, is not interested in those, th those things at all. Once the sounds were uh, thought of as ready-mates, it soon became clear that those ready-mates were much more intrusive than those exhibited in fine art galleries. Due to the nature of the hearing, the sound cannot be a neutral object which we could uh, choose to ignore. The subject experiences the sound uh, intimately on the inside, willingly or not. The subject of noise is thus always penetrated with brutal invasions of sound from the outside. Intrusive sounds destroy his inner consistency and subdue him to alien rhythms, thus eliminating his authenticity and freedom of self-realization in harmonic fullness. The experience of black or death metal is different. There are no constant eruptions of intrusive alien outside that would ruin the coherence and totality. Instead, extreme metal aims at destroying the harmonious totality with its strict structured consistency. At one hand, with dissonance, and at the other, with concentrations of freedoms beyond the cap capabilities of human body. The experience of listening to music is thus not only a purely mental one. Rhythm is felt by the body, while the consciousness derives pleasure from the beauty of harmony. By enjoying the music, especially dance music, one experiences his, himself as an embodied self, uh, which is, of course, a m like misrecognition of self as a body. The pleasure derived from metal could be understood as a pleasure only conditionally, though. Speaking, and it shares a lot with uh, like masochistic pleasure. It is not an elitist pleasure derived from a reflection on tensions between the form and the matter, as some modernists start. Uh, it is more like the enjoyment felt by the torture of the body, or even disembodiment, um, which logic was described by Alenka Zopancic when she talks about the subject's journey to freedom by Kant and the Sad. And uh, I quote, the enjoyment, jusons, which the victim seems to experience and which coincides in this case with their extreme suffering, encounters here an obstacle in the form of the pleasure principle. That is the limit to what the body can endure. This is what is implied in the phrase too soon. The torture ends too soon in relation to the encore, which is the imperative in the direction of jusons. In short, the problem is that the body is not made to the measure of enjoyment. There is no enjoyment but the enjoyment of the body. Yet, if the body is to be equal to the task or duty of Jusson's, the limits of the body have to be transcendent. Pleasure, that is, the limit of suffering that the body can still endure, is thus an obstacle to enjoyment." End of quote. The enjoyment itself thus leads beyond the pathological body and the self, into the kingdom of eternity. Uh, by the way, some Christians, especially the Protestant sects, knew this very well and had devised complex rituals in order to humiliate the body until they would be depraved enough to receive God's grace. And 
of course, this rejection of the body was effectively indulging in most extreme debaucheries and sinful pleasures. The realization of worthlessness of the body and self is the condition for rising from the sphere of bodies and pleasure into the sphere of the eternal. Similarly, Kant's subject reaches this sphere only after the experience of the sublime, in which he realizes the insignificance of his body and mind and discovers in itself the capability of freedom that is not subdued to the logic of the body's empirical reason or pleasure. If we use Kant's terms, we must understand metal not as a pleasant or beautiful, but rather as a sublime, which is as something which leads beyond the pleasure. Kant, due to the regrettable fact that he did not know metal, pictures the dynamical sublime as a mountain storm observed from the safety of a hut. Confronted with this immense power of nature, the subject realizes his insignificance, yet at the same time he discovers in himself the ability to sub subsume the infinity and in comparison to which even the vast spaces or immense powers of nature are insignificant, and the power to exclude himself from the nature, to be able to disregard own self-preservation and pleasure and act only in accordance with the truth and the good. Kant mentioned as a possible example of the sublime war, and as we all know, black metal is Krieg, and visibly, uncomfortably, blasphemy although he immediately proceeds with attempts to prove that blasphemy is not the true sublime. His proofs are here a bit dubious. The ethics of the sublime does, by its own inner logic, lead to diabolical evil. The more Edith is exempt from sense, the more it is without reason, the more sublime it is. No wonder that the enthusiasm for blasphemy and total genocide is a common theme in black metal. The experience of listening to metal does indeed seem to be analo analogous to the sublime. Perhaps it could be said, of course, only very schematically, that grindcore and death metal mostly function as a dynamical sublime, focusing on the humiliation of the body, uh, not only with its lyrical themes, but with direct torture of the body represented with blessed beats that enable speed and intensity of rhythm beyond the rhythms that the body can normally endure. Although the more primitive parts of black metal focuses on the sinful pleasures of the body or its insignificances, or insignificance in the blizzards as well, more refined black metal often functions as mathematical sublime, conjuring sterile coldness of stars and west spaces. A humanist part of modernism was also rejecting with disgust the spheres of bodies and materiality, and saw the meaning of existence only in the immateriality of music. The best example, of course, of this is uh, the jazz, as uh, represented in Sartre's nausea. However, metal does not provide salvation in the form of meaning, harmony, or higher beauty beyond physicality. It is dissonant and ugly. Instead of escape from physicality into eternal truth and goodness, the eternity represents only nothingness and horror without meaning or harmony. Metal is thus closer to Kafka than to Sartre. The perfect analogy for it would be the torture machine from the penal colony. And this means the possibility of access to the eternal truth. However, once a subject commits to this truth with militant fidelity and self-sacrifice, it discloses only the absence of meaning. Perhaps it is worth mentioning another masterpiece of modernist art with similar function. Anarchist Alfonso Lorencic designed prisons during the Spanish Civil War that were built as a kind of modernist Gesamtkunstwerk. The aim was to cause so much stress to those captured in them to cause madness and some kind of destruction of the self. Similar function um, has nowadays uh, the playing of uh, mostly metal music in Guantanamo prison. The perverse obsession of death and partly black metal with carnal pleasures and tortures does, does not function as transgression. Rather than being erotic, it opens up space for transcendence of the order of being beyond which lies no higher truth, only that which is beyond the pleasure principle, namely death drive. This means with Zizek's words, uh, and I quote, 
the uncan uncanny domain beyond the order of being. Uh, it is what he calls the domain between two deaths, the pre-ontological domain of monstrous spectral appar apparitions, the domain that is immortal, yet not in Badulian sense of the immortality of participating in the truth, but in the sense of what Lacan calls lamela, of the monstrous undead object libido, end of quote. This life beyond that is the source of the ultimate horror, although often viewed with sublime beauty. Because it discloses the void in the core of meaning, the suppressed truth of creation that cosmos is not whole. This antagonism, the real in the core of creation, unveiled by black metal, is the ultimate blasphemy. The act of listening to black metal is thus not a pleasurable experience. It is an act of demolition of the world into pure nothingness. So my name is Camille Berra, um, and today I'm going to say a few words about uh, um, black metal, why does it sound so gloomy. Uh, uh, at first I said it was a musicological approach, but now I realize it's more uh, musical, strictly musical approach, because I'm going to uh, put myself in the shoes of someone who doesn't know anything about black metal, and try to... Um, when I say nothing about black metal, it's just you play black metal for someone who doesn't know it exists, who doesn't know what it sounds like, doesn't know anything about the lyrics, about the imagery, about anything. So this is in that kind of mindset that I'm going to try to uh, approach uh, black metal as a sound. <laughs> so um, usually when presenting a, a paper on metal, I tend to keep an objective, uh, open view of a genre, characteristic or historical fact I'm describing. But for today, uh, it's something new for me. I'm going to try to put myself in the shoes of someone who doesn't know what it is. So not necessarily because they don't like it, like I said, but more because they don't have the much needed keys of understanding to navigate and eventually appreciate black metal. One can't argue that listening to some musical styles can be challenging. You don't wake up one morning and adore uh, dodecaphonic music, for example. It takes some training. Um, understanding is a key component uh, leading to liking something that is actually complex. It took time for researchers, especially musicologists, to take an interest uh, into popular music maybe somewhat blocked by Adorno's conception of it. So on one side you have popular music that is utilitary and on the other side you've got uh, classical music that is artistic, aesthetical, or whatever. Now that popular music studies are a growing field, uh, heavy metal's qualities and char characteristics are finally strengths to be reckoned with. Therefore, uh, its complexity is acknowledged. Complexity leads to a lack of understanding, which results in a negative approach. This music doesn't immediately, immediately pleases me, so I don't like it. I think that's what m most people who haven't listened to it before feel the first time. The first, um, one day I had a comment that was actually really on point about the music I was listening to. I was listening, I think it was Inquisition or some bands, some a band like this one, and uh, my brother came in and say, what is that sound? It sounds like the devil is going to come out. And it was really on point, especially because it was Inquisition. <laughs> so, within black metal, several factors are leading to that perception for the non-seasoned listener. Here I'd like to present these factors from the least challenging 
uh, in my opinion, uh, to the most challenging. So uh, the first one would be the structural and harmonic melodic factor. So much like classical music, length uh, is an important factor. The average black metal track is five to seven minutes and sometimes way more long, whereas uh, radio edited songs are unlikely to exceed three or four minutes in length. So that's already a challenge for someone who's used to really short songs. Uh, structures are as well um, quite chaotic sometimes, uh, complex or at least unpredictable changes in riffs often separated by breaks, bar changes, makes memorizing and the expectation of some melody to come back more hazardous. If a pattern alone can be easy to remember and even be uh, hummed, uh, you're never assured that you'll hear it again within the same track. So it's a bit like surprise music. You don't know what to expect all the time. Um, the traditional uh, chorus verse chorus structure is most of the time completely abundant. So the listener loses uh, his um, landmarks. He doesn't know where he is anymore. Considering harmony and melody, Everyone who studied music at school uh, knows that minor scales are to be recognized by children, are described as sad or um, melancholic, whereas uh, major scales are um, linked with happiness, uh, energy, and so on. So, um, for example, uh, I've chose uh, a, a song from a black metal band Kampha. Uh, the album is Mare, it's from 2011. So the song is Bergtat. So they did two versions of this song. There's an original album track version and there's a bonus track version, which is uh, in a major scale. So I can play a few uh, pieces of that. So the original one, if it works. You have your typical, um, well, and then the second version, the magic. So I don't know what you think, but to me, the second one sounds a bit like a Christmas song with a black, black metal vocals on it. It's, it's not right. You don't know why, but it's not really right. So that's because of uh, the scales. So um, as full chords are also uh, generally avoided in black metal, replaced by power chords with no thirds, you don't even get to know if the chord is a happy chord, so a major chord with a major third, or if it's a sad chord with a minor third. In this case, lack leads to negativity. The diminished fifth is also extremely present in black metal tracks. This peculiar chord has been associated with the devil, diabolus in musica in Latin, since the Middle Age, and it's still nowadays linked to a negative feeling. That's why it's uh, featured so much in horror movie soundtracks, and of course in black metal. Same for uh, melodic movements involving chromatic progressions found in black metal classics like Darfron, Bosum, Seminar Recordings, and a lot after that. So I can play, um, maybe, probably everyone knows it, but I can play just um, a bit of Freezing Moon to hear the minor, uh, diminished bit. Uh, 
the second as aspect I'll be discussing is voice, obviously. So voice within extreme metal is probably the biggest and most obvious turn off for a non-season listener. If growled vocals can at least make a few eyebrow eyebrows rise, uh, black metal shrieky, high-pitched, tortured screams are a very negative component of the genre's characteristic. Simply because screams are more often associated with negative emotions, such as anger, pain, or fear, than they are with positive emotions, obviously. Moreover, it seems like popular music, uh, this is there, it's only my own opinion, I don't know if you agree with me, but um, ranking from pop to rap is progressively moving away from technically demanding vocals, with the rise of TV shows like Looking for the New Star or The Voice, I don't know if they're called like that in your country, but yeah. They are, people are, um, the idea that everyone can be a singer instead of everyone can sing uh, is setting new expectation on how you're supposed to be able to sing and what's a good vocalist. More natural and light voices are praised as well as spoken voices with rap. Rich and complex vocalities, such as lyrical and metal techniques, are often deemed too much. Some recent trends, like the millennial whoop um, and an exaggerated level of auto-tune are also damaging the standards of vocal performance. Finally, uh, singing along to black metal is definitely not an easy exercise, so maybe that's a block as well. Uh, my last um, aspect, and I guess it's, uh, it's arguably one of black metal's main aesthetical features, is the dirty old sound of black metal. Uh, when operating their switch from death metal to black metal in the beginning of the 90s, bands like Mayhem and Dark Throne set the infamous dirty sound, uh, called Necro Sound for Bosum, for example, or just simply Lo-Fi which will categorize the genre for more than two decades. Um, I borrow word, words from a French philo philosopher, Pauline Nadrigny, uh, who writes, uh, the central criterion of this aesthetics, she means uh, the aesthetics of rock and metal, is the sound. What in sound often appears as noise. That dirty, noisy sound is what makes black metal stand out, the source of its negativity. Though it is believed that the bands couldn't record in decent conditions, favorizing this transgressive sonic identity, early recordings from Dark Throne, for example, proves, proves the opposite. So as you can hear, if we play um, a song from the first album uh, of Dark Throne, uh, 1991, uh, Soul Side Journey, which is more death metal uh, album. So it's maybe not that obvious here, but the sound is pretty clear compared to a blaze in the northern sky, for example, the year after. So I think the, the Dark Throne example is a really good example, uh, really good, yeah, point. Uh, they used to sound clean, and then uh, they took a turn to sound black metal. So that really shows uh, this dirty necro sound is 
a main aesthetical key uh, to black metal. And it's probably as well, not um, directly, but became within the years uh, designed to scare away people who might take a too close interest into black metal. Thank you. apologize because I was never metal enough to learn Windows. Uh, that's way too hardcore probably for me. So <laughs> I need the technical assistance for the, for the image. Um, I, I will talk about ne neither uh, sound nor message of black metal. And I think th this was not planned, but I think it fits perfectly with the previous two presentation because one was about sound and one more about the, the message or one was about form and musical form and the other about 
uh, let's say, philosophical uh, content. Uh, I will talk about the remains uh, or the leftovers, so uh, about the atmosphere and attitude of uh, black metal and why, why they make it both atmosphere and attitude, why, why they're interesting uh, and at the same time how, how are they different or even opposed to, to the rest of metal altogether. Because I think uh, what black metal has shown and continues to show since at least uh, early 90s is that how, how similar the rest of the metal looks in comparison to its most, uh, let's say, uh, extremist deviation or extremist sub-genre. Sub um, so I think, I think I could probably be excused if I group all the rest of the metal, metal uh, together, at least classical metal. Classical meaning you, you have a band, they dress predominantly in black, they, they have long hair, uh, they play concerts, record their albums and so on. So they basically, um, uh, what I mean by classical uh, metal is people who are behaving like a rock band but with a different, uh, different sound and let's say different lyrical emphasis. What black metal shows, or at least some versions or uh, some artists within black metal, that black me uh, that metal can be uh, can also be um, regarding attitude and atmosphere carried out much much differently. Although the sound may be uh, similar, or some influences in the sound could be carried on from the rest of the metal. I think what really distincts black metal from the rest of the metal is precisely attitude and uh, atmosphere. So. Uh, I think that there, there are perhaps reasons uh, to reconsider even calling uh, black metal uh, metal, at least at some points, so regarding some artists, because I, I think it escapes uh, the rest of the metal in at least two points. So this will be the, the first two points of my uh, uh, presentation. The first will be that uh, black metal at, at a certain point escapes the uh, uh, the very form of a band. So uh, by this I mean this lone misanthropic uh, uh, one one man bands or anti anti bands creating these lo fi uh, uh, black metal sounds and song from their bedrooms or prisons or some other uh, solitary let's say solitary uh, rooms. Um, so this is one line of escape of uh, black metal relinquishing the very form of a band which has been a core of rock music since its very conception and which persists in other forms or other subgenre of uh, metal. Um, and the other is its uh, relation, relation to violence, war, dismemberment, uh, torture and uh, so on. Um, while on the other hand, I think metal, uh, maybe more dead metal and some more let's say brutal or extreme uh, variations of metal, but even the, the cheesiest power, power or speed metal has some iconography or some attitude relating to death, war, skulls uh, and, and so on, torturing, uh, violence and, and so on. Uh, I think black metal still carry still has some relation towards war and violence, but, but with a distinctly different, if not opposed attitude, while the rest of the metal cherishes war, violence and so on, brutality in, in sound, in imagination, in iconography, uh, black metal is more drawn to colder, uh, colder forms of violence or colder dimensions of uh, violence, as in cosmic indifference and so on, exist more existentialist themes than, let's say, classical fascination with war, confrontation, violence, blood, blood and so on. But I'm getting ahead of myself, so this will be my two, two main points. And then additional point, uh, relating, connected to the first two, but also related to the um, black metal's attitude towards uh, technology and what does it mean for its expression, attitude and atmosphere and, and uh, so on. So the first line of uh, escape to, to go back, uh, escape from the, the band form. Um, I would say th this is even more more important point, of course, as we all know, not all black metal artists uh, escape the band form, probably quantitative majority still adheres to the, to the band form, but there are some, some cases, 
probably most famous and most notable Burzum himself, uh, who during, um, who uh, because of the circumstances or because of their decision, chose to abandon the band form. So this is what I will be interested in, not, not all the rest that still carry out, uh, carry out the, the band form. And I think this, this is a very important point regarding black metal's uh, atmosphere and uh, attitude, because classical metal, always has a certain uh, admiration for community in general or is communitarian uh, in, its, in its orientation, let's say in its uh, fantasies, in its message, in its lyrics, in its uh, iconography, but also in its uh, behavior. So a band, uh, a classical rock band or a classical metal band is always a form of community. And then you have a community of fans which circle, uh, which encircle the band. And then you have a community of groupies and the community of critics and the community of publishers and the community, all, all of these micro communities of roadies and so on, all of these support uh, communities. So like rock music in general or rock culture in general and especially alternative versions of rock culture so is classical uh, metal or typical metal very very uh, communitarian in its uh, attitude and in its manner of functioning so you have people who get in touch with other people to form a band to practice and and so on to, and then get in touch with other people do things together, tour together, uh, uh, um, record together, and so on. So this is this is a communitarian aspect of typical metal, which is not very different from communitarian aspect of uh, rock culture uh, in general. And as rock culture in general uh, emphasizes its communitarian aspect as a kind of social uh, social critique in a sense, in a soulless contemporary society of mindless consumerism, or do a peak of this generic uh, social critique, we can persevere some kind of, uh, some kind of authentic human uh, uh, bond of some kind of authentic community uh, um, by forming this alternative communities, regardless of the genre. It can be reggae, it can be uh, punk, it can be typical metal and so on. So you have soullessness of uh, a contemporary society on the one hand and the warmth of community, let's say this alternative. That's, or this is precisely why these communities call themselves alternative, because they're precisely not soulless and cold like the rest of the commercialized and so on corrupted uh, uh, world. So. Um, the, the basic organizational form in typical metal is still, is still uh, a band and also the core of the uh, fantasy or the message or the uh, attitude of typical metal is basically acceleration or uh, driving to the extreme this communitarian aspect that is present in all of the rock, rock uh, culture, which is a fantasy of an organic uh, community. So uh, metal is more edgy. So uh, if, if a typical rock band will enjoy their uh, fantasy of uh, organic uh, community, uh, a typical death metal band will push this fantasy to, to, its extreme, uh, to its extreme consequences. They will fantasize about uh, uh, historical examples, uh, for example, Viking community or a pre-Christian uh, authentic warrior uh, community before this Judeo-Christian uh, um, uh, corruption se set in on this noble warrior medieval or ancient, uh, ancient uh, cultures before democracy, mass media, capitalism and uh, all the bad soulless things that dominate in a contemporary society. So you have a, a fantasy of organic uh, uh, community and noble barbaric past. This can be uh, uh, some real historical examples most uh, most commonly Vikings, or it can be a, a fantasy world or so, some some kind of mixtures uh, uh, between the two. Uh, while on the other hand, black metal, uh, black metal's attitude is misanthropic on on both of these uh, uh, fronts. So in both relinquishing the band as a micro community, which should be a model community, micro-organic, uh, closely bonded uh, community, and on the level of imagination uh, uh, and message, but it relinquishes all of the 
or at least interesting black metal or the most uh, advanced or avant-garde black metal also relinquishes all of the nostalgia for a barbaric past or noble barbaric uh, past. So, so in, in black metal there is, a, there is an interesting tendency, I will not say it's dominant, it's probably not at least quantitatively, um, there's an interesting tendency to, uh, uh, for a classical band form to be replaced by misanthropic, misanthropic loners or sound projects without defined, uh, uh, or musical projects without defined authors or personas uh, behind them, or at least where, where the membership is not, membership is not fixed, so, uh, which also means there, there is no classical uh, teenage or post-adolescent drama, which comes necessarily comes with the, with the form of the uh, band. While on the level of imagination or fantasy, this Vikingish kitsch is more and more uh, replaced uh, by the distance, uh, distance or even disgust towards sociality as such. So instead of a fantasy of organic community struggling against the, the soulless capitalist Judeo-Christian whatever uh, uh, world. Uh, you have a fascination with precisely soullessness, not just of the world, but the world at large, soullessness of the cosmos or uh, indifference of the, the cosmos. So to, to put it formalically, I would say, at least in its most interesting aspect, uh, black metal develops social anorexia. It's not, a, it's not a form of community bonding or social bonding uh, at all, but in, in, in its most misanthropic or most uh, consecutively, uh, 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 systematically misanthropic aspect, it's, it's more akin to social anorexia, so total subtraction from the, uh, subtraction from the, or withdrawal from the uh, social world, which stands in kind of stark opposition with uh, typical metal or rock, even to, to put it more generally, uh, rock music, uh, machistic male bonding, predominantly uh, uh, male uh, bonding, uh, so uh, I think this is one uh, this is one really interesting aspect of uh, of black metal because uh, this fantasy this critique of soullessness of the modern world and also nostalgia for organic communities are predictably conservative. There's nothing really interesting or uh, extreme about it. Well, the sounds, let's say, of death metal and so on might be extreme, might take some getting used to and so on. Uh, let's say its attitude is very predictably and I would dare to say boringly uh, conservative. In, in a sense, community is better than rootlessness and uh, uh, knowing where you come from is better than cosmopolitanism and, and uh, so on. And Vikings were cool and long hair is cool to, to caricature uh, a, a little. Um, so, so I think this kind of uh, anorexic, misanthropic uh, approach, uh, regardless of our attitude towards it, if we support it, if we like it, and so on, it's at least more interesting, or less predictable, uh, less predictably uh, uh, con conservative. So uh, I put I put great hopes in the uh, in uh, black metal. Maybe they're unfounded. Maybe they're my personal fantasy, because I anticipated that some 20 years ago, at the break of the century, uh, uh, century that. Uh, the band form will die away or wither away because there, there are so many signs, there are so many writings on, on, on the wall. At the one hand, you had the figure of a DJ, so uh, again a loner, but not socially anorexic loner, socially very popular loner, but the person with its laptop in its... In its uh, in this person's laptop, the general intellect of the whole of electronic uh, music. So he had this like alienated, uh, heavily technologically mediated approach or a relation between human person and uh, musical world. And this was fascinating and for me, because I, uh, this was my visual thinking, he signaled the, the death toll of the, of the uh, band form. On the other hand, you had projects from, uh, from the uh, jazz musicians, which never really liked the, the band form so much, so they formed these loose associations or uh, projects to the Wooten clan of the 90s, which also had flexible membership, uh, was very conceptual, was very uh, conceptual and uh, so on. So, so you had all kinds of signs that the band form 
might be withering away, but it never happened. It, it, it survived the DJs, it survived the, the plans and the project. So uh, put my last hopes on uh, black, black metal. The history, history will tell whether it be successful in its, uh, um, uh, whether it be, will be victorious over the, the band form. So, so in this hikikomorish uh, withdrawal, social, social anorexia, and now, now for my uh, uh, se second point, so the first was a uh, community of typical metal versus social anorexia of at least some versions of uh, uh, black metal. Uh, now, relation towards violence or violent uh, fantasies, violent uh, uh, imagination and imagery, uh, if the horror imagination of classical or typical uh, metal um, um, is founded on the, uh, at the same time, scare, the, the scariness and at the same time, uh, fascination or attractiveness of uh, violence, uh, war, war and so on, of uh, sp spilling blood, mutilating uh, corpses or living uh, creatures, I, I would call this fascination or this kind of imagination or fantasy hot horror because uh, um, the blood is squirting everywhere, the, the bodies are still kind of uh, kind of warm, the, the heat of war or the heat of battle and, and so on. So, so um, uh, to use this, uh, this thing, McLuhan's distinction between hot and cold media, this, was, this, this would certainly be hot, uh, hot uh, horror. But as opposed to this, of course, uh, uh, black metal is also very much into horror, demons, uh, uh, and, and so on, but it, it researches or explores uh, a much more abstract uh, dimension, dimension of uh, horror, uh, a problem of cosmic uh, meaninglessness in indifference as such. So I would call this cold horror or a fascination with coldness, the, uh, or fascination with the demonic, which is more cold than hot, which is uh, more indifferent than directly, directly uh, violent. So what, what black metal is interesting, interested in, and the reason why I'm interested in uh, uh, black metal, because it's less, less predictable, um, what black metal is interested in is, is uh, uh, violence or horror, but not as a relation between something that is hostile uh, to us or aggressive uh, uh, to us, uh, not as a relation uh, towards something, something we fear and something we fight against or struggle, struggle against, because this still means some kind of a relation, although it's antagonist. If we had, if we are at war with something or fighting something or defending ourselves against something, we still form some kind of antagonistic uh, uh, relation. Uh, well, in opposition to that, black metal metaphors of coldness, uh, uh, darkness are not only uh, um, akin to Latvian jokes, but they have so, some, other, uh, some other pertinence. So these black metal metaphors of darkness and coldness, cold uh, deserts, uh, mean more like a, a non-relation of cosmos towards uh, humanities or the world, the universe as such towards uh, uh, humanities, or a total indifference of, of the cosmos towards anything. So, so this is a non-relation, uh, demonic in Black metal fantasy or black metal imagination does not mean something that will rip us apart in or uh, scare us in our sleep or enter our night. It, it does mean to, to an extent, but the, the most interesting uh, uh, black metal artists and their uh, imagination is about cosmic indifference. So the scariest thing is that the, the universe is indifferent, not that there are so, some kind of entities which are in typical metal, usually pictured in a very childish, infantile way. So so like monsters with horns and so on that will uh, attack us or chase us away and, and uh, uh, so on. So in black metal imaginations, it's usually just uh, a forest in the winter or not even forest, just dark sky in the winter uh, uh, and so on. So total indifference, total coldness, which might be even more uh, scary than aggressive creatures uh, fighting a war against us or us fighting a war uh, against them. So, um, so on the level of uh, so on the level of atmosphere, uh, black metal is much close to the experience of depression. Uh, uh, 
uh, uh, while typical metal would be more about warrior euphoria, so, so in a sense blood pumping with this hot horror of war, anticipation, fascination uh, uh, with, with violence and so on, uh, black metal is more on the side of, of uh, depression so, or, or depressive stubborn, so you, you cannot do anything, so faced with this or realizing, let's say, realizing this cosmic meaningless indifference, you, you, you fall into a kind of a stabber, you cannot really do anything, you are far from euphoric or uh, uh, fascinated, um, so uh, uh, closer to depression than to any kind of euphoria or dysphoria as opposed to typical metal, uh, metal uh, euphoria. And now to, to my second point, I think I took a lot of time more than previous uh, presentation. So quickly about the, um, uh, my last point about technology, technology and uh, metal, which my, with my which might be a bit uh, bizarre of a topic or a, of a point, because black metal is, uh, as, as we heard in the previous presentation, it can be anti-technological or at least fix, fixated on low-fi, low technology, uh, dirty sound and so on. But I think uh, um, technology was crucial for black metal since the 90s and, and very high technology, very developed uh, technology, because it, it allowed black metal to begin uh, emancipating itself from, from the band form. So from the, this cassette tape recorder that Ildi Arn took to Norwegian Woods to, to record himself, to uh, Burzum synth in the uh, synthesizer in the prison, uh, uh, then state of the art or cutting edge technology had a very large, uh, very large part. It allowed, uh, and today's bedroom recording devices, computers and so on, they allowed for the recording artificially dirty or artificially lo-fi uh, recording and dissemination of uh, black metal. I don't, I don't think there's a coincidence, but they didn't explore this enough to, to claim anything definitive, but I don't think there's a coincidence that uh, uh, metal fan base and gaming fan base correspond to a large degree. Uh, uh, I think the, the link is precisely technology, computers and so on, but the, uh, the imagination of both gaming uh, or some parts of gaming community and metal fans can be romantic or anti-technological, so, so this is not, uh, this is not very, very, uh, very uh, explicit. And I think technology was also important for the development of uh, black metal since the 90s, because uh, high technology allow, allows us to do things we don't know how to do. So this, this allows us to dispense with any notion of virtuosity. So you, you can make music without having any idea how, how to make music because you're helped by the, the synthesizer, the, the computer and, and so on. So you can know the, the very basic. So basically playing black metal doesn't uh, doesn't require you to, to really know how to play guitar. I mean, it doesn't hurt, but you, you don't need to, but you can still sound better than punk bands because they, they sounded like they don't know how, how to play. But you can, you can actually get good sounds out of black metal with computer resistant or uh, technology assistance. So basically what you do, I know how this metaphor will, uh, analogy will sound, but I, I stand by it. Uh, what you do when trying to create, uh, let's say, it not, uh, trying to create contemporary black metal, which does not necessarily even, uh, even include live guitar playing, you just, just programming it on your computer without knowing how to play any instrument. Basically, you do the same thing that we do every day when we took uh, we take pictures uh, uh, with our mobile phones, especially if we have two cameras and AI assistants. Basically, we reach the skill of a professional photographer without knowing anything about how to, how to take a photo. So, uh, so to reach this level of misanthropy, relinquishing of uh, craftsmanship or uh, virtuosity and so on, I think, I think the technology, technology was, uh, uh, technology was uh, very important. Uh, so this is, this is all uh, I had for today. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all the speakers. So it's time for uh, questions and comments. So. Anybody? So 
Sorry, uh, this won't be a question about metal, but pretty much you mentioned uh, the jazz artist and the uh, uh, metal artist and the hip hop artist and the electronic artist. Where does the singer songwriter stand in relation to the band form? I think that's a very good uh, that's a very good observation because you you can say that from the 60s you you also have like these loners that drop out of the the band form and just just become folk singers uh, uh, and just just one person with with a guitar and so on uh, that's also so, some kind of uh, withdrawal so or maybe Re, uh, reverting to some kind of older forms before uh, before the band when you actually had these fo traveling folk singers with their uh, uh, guitars but they so, so I would say it's, it's the same desertion or similar desertion from the band form uh, but less interesting because it's not so misanthropic and edgy uh, I would say <laughs> it's more like socially critical and uh, anybody else so let me conclude. Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, we will start tomorrow at one, like today. Thank you everybody. <laughs>